a point named for you is that I will never be pointless. <laughs> so I will never forget the first time I put on a dry suit as a graduate student and we slipped through an ice hole about three foot in diameter into water that was minus 1.8 degrees centigrade. My heart was racing. I was nervous. But when I came down below the ice, I could see forever. You can see 500 to 1,000 feet under the ice in Antarctica when you dive. And I looked down and the seafloor was covered with life. There were sponges and soft corals and starfish and sea urchins as far as you could see. It's actually one of the richest marine ecosystems on the planet. If you looked at the amount of life on the seafloor in Antarctica, it would be similar to the Great Barrier Reefs of Australia. Well, I lived and I worked at McMurdo Station, the largest American station, for about 10 years. Um, I would go down for a couple months at a time. And uh, what a wonderful place to work. But I used to hear about another station. It was called Palmer Station. It was spoken with some reverence. It was a beautiful little station, and instead of having a thousand people at it during this austral summer like McMurdo, there were only 44 people, and it was perched on a point, and it was the perfect place to do marine biology. And fortunately, our research took us there, and that was 20 years ago. What I didn't know was that I was moving to a region of Antarctica that's rapidly changing and warming. So that's what I want to tell you about today is what it was like, or what it continues to be like to be working here and learning about these changes. So we all know about warming. Um, if you look at this image from National Geographic uh, back in 2006, you can see it's very Arctic-centric. Everything's about the Arctic warming, not so much the Antarctic. It turned out that this is partly because we really hadn't looked closely. And on the cover of one of the most prestigious science journals called Nature uh, a few years later, you can see that it's not just the 800 mile length peninsula that's warming, but also the western portion of the continent, uh, what we call the western ice sheet there. And now we know, because we've been following uh, ice shelf melting around Antarctica, that those little red, red areas around the continent would indicate that it's also beginning to warm on the eastern side of Antarctica. The ice shelf is melting. You've probably heard about this in the news. So it's not just a western phenomenon. Well, how much warming are we talking about? Well, fortunately, my home is where that arrow is. There's a little station on Anvers Island. You go across the Drake Passage to get there. Uh, you might need sea sickness medication sometimes, but a lot of the times it's not so bad. And we're very lucky 20 miles from our station to have a Ukrainian station that's been taking air temperatures for 60 plus years. And if you plot those temperatures, uh, daily temperatures over that period of time, uh, the air temperatures have warmed up about 10 degrees Fahrenheit over that 60 year period, which is uh, pretty astounding actually, um, similar to what we're seeing happen in the Arctic. So what does that mean? Well, for me, it meant that when I arrived at the station 20 years ago, about once or twice a week, I would hear a huge crash and I would leap up from my chair and run down the hall and throw open the door and watch the big waves coming down the bay. All the scientists would crowd around the door, people that worked at the station to see the waves. This was a big deal because the Mar Glacier behind us had just dropped a huge chunk of ice. When I was here a year and a half ago now, um, it was calving, dropping chunks of ice into the bay five or six times a day. Um, the noise of the crash didn't even bring you out of your chair. It was just part of the background of living there. So this is a very dramatic change over just two decades. 87% um, of the glaciers along the Western Antarctic Peninsula are now retreating. Now we have better data than just running down the hall. We also have a science technician that every so often I coerce to put a backpack on with a GPS in it and go for a hike and he or she will hike the leading edge of the glacier. And they're talking to a satellite above them and they can come back and they can pinpoint exactly where the edge of the glacier is. You can see the most recent line was drawn in 2017. Um, I need to get them to do this again. Look at the picture, the little picture of Chuck and Maggie Amsler from UAB here, who my, I work with in Antarctica. When Maggie came down in the 70s, she said you could open the door of the station and almost step onto the glacier. And now you have to hike about a half a kilometer to get to it. You can also see it in this picture here. 
Uh, look where the glacier was in 1975, and look where it was in 2013. Just a dramatic change. We also know that glacial ice is thinning. Those areas of red are areas where a satellite with an instrument on it has been able to measure glacial thinning to the accuracy of about a centimeter, if you can imagine. And so once again, this sort of reinforces what I said. It's the western side of the continent and the peninsula that are warming most rapidly. And look at Greenland. I was just there a few weeks ago. Greenland is undergoing a tremendous amount of melt. All right, so a big surprise. This caught scientists off guard. Uh, it's called the Thwaites Glacier. It's over on the western portion of the continent. The Thwaites Glacier is receding at an unprecedented rate. The concern here is the Thwaites Glacier is effectively a cork. It is the point at which the western ice sheet, which is two to, mile, two to three miles thick ice sitting on top of the western portion of the continent, is moving through that area where the Thwaites Glacier is. These ice sheets are moving, the west to the west, the east to the east. Um, and so the concern is if the Thwaites Glacier disappears, the rate of movement of that ice mass on the western portion of the continent could be accelerated, which means more sea level rise. So that's uh, something that scientists are following closely. If you look at the ice shelves, now I haven't mentioned ice shelves. Ice shelves are about 1,000 foot deep, and they're in the water, and they're attached to land. Okay, And I want to show you some of the major breakouts of ice shelves that have happened over the last 30 or 40 years. Look at the Larsen B ice shelf over on the east side of the peninsula. This picture was taken by a satellite in 2002 on, in January. Look at the striations in the ice sheet. This really got people's attention. They came back a month later, and the entire Larsen B ice shelf was in the process of breaking up and going out to sea. Two weeks later, it did. So this is a piece of ice about the size of the state of Rhode Island, 1,000-foot deep ice. Okay, That's a big event. More recently, in 2017, about five years ago now, um, the Larsen C ice shelf developed a crack. The crack was followed closely by news stations, and sure enough, it began to widen, and eventually, that big chunk floated out to sea. That was a chunk of ice the size of Delaware that floated out to sea. Um, it was one of the largest icebergs in history of our, of our humanity uh, when it floated away. Well, the good news about ice shelves breaking out is that because they are already in the ocean, they're already in water, when they melt, which they inevitably do as they sail to the north, when they melt, they do not contribute significantly to sea level rise. And this is the same physics as a glass of ice water. When the ice melts, the water doesn't come over the top of the glass. So that's the good news. The concerning news is that ice shelves help block ice sheets from rolling into the ocean. So when you remove the ice shelf, you're removing a barrier that's holding the ice sitting on top of the continent back. And that acceleration of that ice into the water when it comes from land into water does contribute to sea level rise. And in the equations that we're using now to determine whether we're gonna have a third of a meter or a meter of sea level rise by the end of the century, Antarctica is definitely part of that calculation. So, ice. But I'm more of a an animal guy. I'm a marine ecologist. So I became very curious what was happening along the Antarctic Peninsula as it warms so quickly. And it's not just my work, it's the work of many scientists. And I want to share perhaps the most poignant story, and that is the story of the Adelie penguin. If you look at the fellow in the back of this image, his name is Bill Frazier. He came here to Palmer Station when he was a graduate student in about 1974. For his doctoral project, he tagged 16,000 breeding pairs of Adelie penguins. Now that is a doctoral project. He has come back every year since then. So for almost 50 years, he's come back and followed that population of Adelie penguins. Um, so what has he found? Well, Bill's Adelie penguins are the purple line on this graph. And you can see the 16,000 breeding pairs he tagged in 74 or 73. And now they're down to, I think he told me for 2021, 
for about a thousand that are left. So in other words, about 90% of the population has disappeared. At the same time, in the green line, the chin strap, the penguin in the top right hand picture has shown up. And there's smaller numbers, but there's three or 400 breeding pairs. And the Gen 2 in the middle picture has really shown up. These guys are moving in quickly. Thousands of breeding pairs have arrived. Well, the interesting thing is that these two species, the Gen 2 and the chin strap, shouldn't really be here. The reason that they're here is because it's warming very rapidly and they're moving down from the warmer areas into areas that are warming. They're extending their range. So what's happening to the Adelie? Why is the Adelie penguin disappearing? It's not moving because they don't show up tagged in other areas. Well, Bill thinks it's a couple of things. One is that as the air is warming in Antarctica, it's becoming more humid. And with greater humidity, it's snowing more and later than it used to. So the Adelie penguins are genetically hardwired to show up at the same time every year and lay their eggs. So they come in, they lay their eggs, and then you get this unseasonably late snowstorm that can bury the colony. And when the snow melts, sadly, the eggs can't survive that melt. So that's a big deal. The other thing is the sea ice. Now, I haven't mentioned sea ice yet, but sea ice is only about four or five feet deep and it doubles the size of the Antarctic continent in the winter. Can you imagine a continent the size of India and China is doubled in size? And then it breaks up and disappears in the warming summer. Sea ice is so dependable that there are species in Antarctica that we call sea ice dependent. They have literally adapted to the sea ice. The Adelie penguin is one of them. They are sea ice dependent. They use the sea ice as a platform to get on their bellies and use their flippers or their wings and toboggan across the ice miles offshore till they get to the edge of the ice and into the water they go to feed on krill. Now krill are those little shrimp that are the quintessential base of the Antarctic food webs. Hugely abundant. Well Bill thinks what's happening as we lose sea ice along the peninsula is the Adelie now has to swim much further offshore to get to its food instead of sliding across the snow, and that takes a lot of energy. And they're on a very tight energy budget to raise their young. So this is another problem. Well, the krill themselves, these little shrimp-like animals, uh, are very important. And we have learned in the last 20 years that when they're teenagers, they live under the sea ice, and they feed on little plant cells called diatoms. The sea ice is disappearing, that means the habitat and the food for teenage krill could also be threatening to them. So this is something that scientists are studying. All right, so what other things feed on krill? Well, baleen whales. So they could be impacted as krill populations change. I'm very happy to report to you tonight that whales are not having a hard time in Antarctica as I speak. In fact, whales have returned to Antarctica in greater and greater numbers. Uh, on a recent cruise to Antarctica, I counted some 50, I think it was 52 humpback whales in a single afternoon from the ship. So why are the whales everywhere? Why are they bubble feeding so vi you know, vibrantly? If you haven't ever seen a bubble feeding whale, you need to do it, put it on your list. Bubble feeding is where uh, you have whales that go down, the humpback will go down with a buddy, and they'll blow bubbles. And they blow a cylinder of bubbles. And within the cylinder are krill that get scared of the bubbles, and they all sort of pack together real tight. And then the whales dive down and take turns coming up through the krill with their mouth open and seining out the krill with their baleen. And to lean off a ship and look down and see the mouth of a whale coming up through the bubbles and then the krill getting caught on the baleen is just amazing. So whales are doing well, that's good. Oh, and the reason for that I mentioned, I wanted to tell you is that whale biologists believe that their populations were so reduced during the whaling period, late 1800s, early 1900s, that it has literally taken this long to get to a population size where they begin to really take off again. So we're at the takeoff stage, which is nice. What other species could be impacted by the loss of the sea ice? Well, one of my favorite seals is the Waddell seal. And she is sea ice dependent. Not so much he, but she. Because when she's pregnant, 
She swims up under the sea ice and finds a weak spot in the ice to chew with her teeth. She has special teeth. They're called ice chipping teeth. Why is she doing that? Well, she gets a breathing hole, and then she can take her time, and she'll keep working on the ice with her teeth until she has a hole that's big enough that she can literally climb up out of the sea ice onto the side of the ice and give birth next to the hole. Her babies, her pups, are now safe from leopard seals, from killer whales that are prowling the ice edge. So she's able to protect her young because she has a very special set of teeth. I don't think these seals are going to disappear like the Adelie. I'm guessing that they're probably going to follow the retreat of the sea ice, or maybe, maybe they'll go to shore. Another species that we don't know what's going to happen uh, as the sea ice disappears is this beautiful leopard seal. Now, leopard seals are at the top of the food web in Antarctica. They are ferocious territorial animals. They are 10 feet long and 1,000 pounds. And when we see one of these and we're diving, uh, we tell the divers to get out of the water as quickly as possible. We actually have a siren that we drop off of the Zodiac boat into the water and set off. This is because these seals can be very menacing. So the divers will come together and wait for an opportunity when the seals or when the seal is not in the area and comes zooming up uh, and we grab them and pull them into the boat and we leave the area and dive in another spot. But they are beautiful animals and they have never been seen giving birth anywhere but on the sea ice, like on an ice float. So the question is, as the sea ice is gone, is leaving us, what's going to happen? Well, we know for the first time that leopard seals have started to go to shore and lay on the shore instead of the ice. Nobody to date has ever found one that had given birth on land, but that may happen. We'll see. What about the small things in the water, the plankton, the phytoplankton and the zooplankton? How are they responding to these warming trends? Well, we're very fortunate to have a group down at Palmer called the Long-Term Ecological Research Program. And it's run uh, until recently by this gentleman here, um, Hugh Ducklow, uh, with the white hat on. He's a professor up at Columbia University. And I asked Hugh if he would do me a big favor because I wanted him to compress 35 years of data collection into one slide. Well, he did a pretty good job. Um, this is where the ship goes every year up and down these transects. It's a six-week cruise, and they collect every imaginable amount of data you can think of, water chemistry, zooplankton, phytoplankton, etc. So he put together this one slide. And what it shows is the 1970s and 80s compared to the 90s and 2000s. Um, the northern tip of the peninsula is in the top two cartoons, and the southern portion of the peninsula is in the bottom two cartoons. So if you look at the top, um, in the big picture, what's happening is we're going from a polar climate to a warm, humid, sub-Antarctic climate. And what's happening is the weather's changing. It's cloudier. It's windier. With more wind, the surface of the ocean is being churned, and phytoplankton and zooplankton are being pushed deeper because of this increased amount of motion in the water. Some of the zooplankton that krill like to eat are those that are not doing very well under these new conditions. Uh, so the krill population is dropping, and they're being replaced with salps. Salps are not a good thing. They're little gelatinous organisms the size of a walnut. They have the nutritional value of lettuce as opposed to krill, which would be the equivalent of steak. So it's not a good substitution. Further down on the southern portion of the peninsula, things haven't changed as much, but Bill thinks that that's, or I'm sorry, Hugh thinks that that's probably coming. What other things are gonna happen as it warms? Well, not a lot of people appreciate the fact that we have forests in Antarctica. All you have to do to find a forest in Antarctica is to put on your dry suit with me, slip into the water in front of Palmer Station, and you will be swimming in a forest of 150 species of seaweeds. Some of them are towering over your head. Some of them have blades that are 10 feet long. It's really quite remarkable. I think that these forests are probably going to do well in a warming world because there's not going to be sea ice above them to block the sunlight. They're going to have more energy more photosynthesis. So they may grow deeper than they have, and they may extend their, their, their distribution to the south a bit more as it warms. 
We also know that these plants, these seaweeds, produce chemical defenses, and this is from our own research. Um, and they do this because they're living in a soup of little crustaceans that would love to eat them. Um, what's going to happen when there's more sunlight, there's more energy to produce chemistry? Uh, it could change the dynamics of who is eating who in this ecosystem. We don't know. What about the offspring, the larvae, of sea urchins and starfish and sponges and soft corals? Larvae of marine invertebrates are much like uh, a caterpillar is to a butterfly. Uh, a lot of you in here might not uh, guess that you're looking at a baby sea star. This is a larval sea star. It spends four or five months in the water in Antarctica as it develops. and It'll settle to the seafloor and become a little starfish. Four to five months, that's a very slow development period. If you collect these larvae, as we have and others have, and you bring them in the laboratory and you raise the temperature two degrees centigrade, they develop in four to five weeks instead of months. They're very sensitive to temperature because they just haven't ever experienced warming. Um, they don't die, they just develop more quickly. That could be good. Uh, it might mean they're in the water less where they're vulnerable to predators. But it could also be a, a challenge because a lot of these larvae feed on phytoplankton at a certain time, and phytoplankton bloom at a certain time in Antarctica. What if they showed up at the cafeteria and the door was locked? And they couldn't get into their food. That's something that climate scientists worry about a lot, is how predator and prey are set off from each other in this new world. Well, I already mentioned two species that have shown up since it started warming. Remember, the Gen 2 penguin, and the chin strap penguin. Well, guess what? They're not alone. Elephant seals have come in. Elephant seals, subantarctic, warmer species. They've been around the station for quite a while now. They have established a breeding colony. They're having babies. The, the picture in the lower portion of this slide is an Antarctic fur seal. They have also begun to move in uh, be, as it's warming. They have not established a colony to have young, but I think that's just a matter of time. So this is another example of what we call a range extension occurring as it warms. Probably the most dramatic and the most poignant range extension that I could tell you about today, I will set the stage with this image. You are looking at the ancient seafloor of the shelf communities of the Antarctic continent. Now think back, Antarctica actually separated from South America about 50 million years ago. And then about 25 million years ago, the Antarctic Circumpolar Current was established. This is a clockwise current that goes around Antarctica. It is the largest current on our planet. And it effectively locked Antarctica into a freezer. So some of those marine species were able to adapt and some could not. So the ones that are there are quite unique. They're endemics, they're native species by now. Very few of these species are defended. They, they tend to be very weakly calcified. Um, if I was to hand Randy an Antarctic clam, he could crush the shell with two fingers, very thinly calcified. This could be related to the fact that there's some things missing here. There are no sharks in Antarctic waters. There are no fish with crushing jaws. All 150 species of Antarctic fish are wimps. They have weak little jaws and they feed on crustaceans, tiny little crustaceans. There is nothing in the sea, nothing on the seafloor, the shelf, that has a claw. There are no crabs, there are no lobsters. So if you're a clam, you don't have to have a big thick shell like you would on the coast of Alabama. Um, so you can imagine the shock of my colleagues uh, Sven Thatchy, who on January 25th, 2007, was flying a deep water submarine. He was up in the ship, he had a little control box, and his remote operated vehicle was at 1,123 meters of depth, pretty deep, below the shelf, and he came across 13 king crabs. First time king crabs had ever been seen on the Antarctic slope. This was a huge shock to everybody because everybody knew that crabs don't like cold water. In fact, if you put crabs in really cold water, they can't regulate magnesium in their body fluids and they effectively act like they're drunk. 
they fall over. They miss their mouth when they're trying to eat. Um, it's a well-known fact. The idea was that as you come up the Antarctic slope towards the underwater shelf, it gets colder. And that was keeping king crabs that have lived in the deep sea for millions of years out of Antarctica. King crabs in Antarctica would not be a good thing. Well, I put a proposal together with a fellow in Florida, Dr. Aronson, and he and I submitted it to NSF. And while that proposal was being reviewed to study the crabs, another group came across a population of king crabs living in a very deep canyon uh, within sight of Palmer Station. So we knew the king crabs were down there. We didn't know much about them. So we got funded by NSF, and Rich and I had three cruises to Antarctica. We would rent a submarine from Woods Hole, and we would drag it behind the ship up the Antarctic slope and onto the shelf in 10 kilometer long transects. On the front of the submarine were two cameras taking pictures every five seconds of the seafloor so that we could look at the population of crabs. How many of them are, are there? Uh, what sizes are they? Are, where they are, are they eating things? Are they having an effect on the community? You can imagine the number of pictures that we had. We did like seven of these 10 kilometer transects. We had hundreds of thousands of pictures to analyze. When scientists have very complex data to analyze, they use a very special instrument called the graduate student. <laughs> and so <laughs> our graduate students worked long and hard and told us in the end that there were in fact millions of king crabs on the Antarctic slope. However, they had not reached the shelf. They were still several hundred meters below the shelf. So that's good, they haven't gotten there yet. Now finally, I wanna mention ocean acidification. Uh, it is the stepchild to climate warming. It's the phenomenon that when carbon dioxide is released into the atmosphere from burning fossil fuels, about a third of that ends up in the oceans. And there is a chemical reaction that takes place that effectively makes it more acidic. So in since the Industrial Revolution, the world's oceans have become about 30% more acidic. So this is a challenge in the Antarctic especially, because the colder the water is, the more CO2 or carbon dioxide is absorbed. So this is the canary in the coal mine for ocean acidification. And we have submitted grant proposals and done research in ocean acidification uh, at Palmer Station for a number of years now. Now, uh, not our group, but another group in Antarctica has discovered that these beautiful little Antarctic animals called sea butterflies, they have a beautiful little aragonite shell. They're the size of the tip of a pencil and they're as common as the stars in the sky. They're so common, they're actually part of the global carbon cycle, if you can imagine. Um, you can go to certain areas of the Antarctic Ocean and you can uh, dip these little animals out of the water and look at them under a microscope and you can see the etching, the shell is beginning to dissolve a little bit from ocean acidification. So this is happening uh, right now. So we have had some work that we've had funded at, at the station on ocean acidification, looking mainly at shelled uh, invertebrates and different types of crustaceans. And these two doctoral students of ours have done their dissertations on ocean acidification here at the station, Kate Schoenrock and Julie Schramm. What they find Basically, the, the take-home message is some species seem to do very well. They don't seem to be negatively impacted, and others have a really hard time, even to the point where they may die uh, from exposure. So you really have to look at everything to see what the story is going to be. All right, so lots of things are happening. The ice sheets are changing, glacial recessions. Uh, we have pack ice disappearing. We've got populations of penguins, especially the Adelis, that are having a tough time. Uh, phytoplankton communities are changing. Uh, temperature might impact larvae. Things are moving around. We could have king crabs. Um, it's a big story happening over a very short period of time. Um, we have a community that has looked like this for millennia, where you have a very predictable annual sea ice. You have good, solid populations of krill. The Adelie penguin was the only and dominant penguin in the system. I uh, have the, the seafloor forests and the benthic community, um, and all of this is being fed by the ACC, the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, very nutrient-rich water. So where are we headed? 
by mid-century, certainly no later than end of century, that sea ice along the peninsula will be gone. Um, we may have much fewer krill. Uh, the penguins will be replaced. The Adelie will be replaced with the Gen 2 and the chin strap. Uh, the forests will have expanded. King crabs may or may not be in the system, but they could be. Uh, and again, all being fed by the Antarctic circumpolar current. So the take home story here is change. And when you think about climate change, people can say uh, quite accurately that climate always changes. Of course it does. It's always changed and it will continue to change. But what's so fundamentally different about this is that it's changing so fast. Uh, organisms have a hard time keeping up with these changes. So we're going to have uh, some that will probably not survive these changes. So why should we care? Uh, why should we care about climate change in Antarctica? It's a long way from Hoover to Antarctica, I can tell you. Take me a week. If I left right now, it would take me a week to get to Antarctica. Um, and that's getting there pretty quick, actually. So why should we care? Um, well, let me give you an example that's close to home. So our research at UAB has been focused largely in an area known as chemical ecology. And chemical ecology is the study of how chemicals are involved in the distribution and abundance of life. How do they affect each other? Do they protect certain species from being eaten? But these chemicals that we discover can also be active against cancer and AIDS and cystic fibrosis and bacterial infections. In other words, there is a drug discovery component to this work. And Bill Baker, a co-PI on our program, is a drug uh, natural products chemist. And so that works out very nicely. We collect our invertebrates for our studies of chemical ecology. We always get enough to also do drug discovery. Two quick stories. This tunicat, tunicates are related to, to the vertebrate group that we're in, but then they, they turn into a blob. Well, this blob that's on the seafloor in front of the station in great abundance turned out to have a chemical in it that we named palmarolide. We named it after Palmer Station. We sent it off to the National Cancer Institute. They screened it against 20 different types of human cancer cell lines. And they called us up at UAB and said, can we work on this compound? We're excited about it. And when the NCI says that to you, you say, yes, you may work on this chemical. Please do. And so the first thing they wanted to do was to make it. Because they knew we couldn't take giant ships to Antarctica and harvest a billion kilos of this thing and ship it back. You have to be able to make it in the lab. And they did. It took 13 steps to make this chemical. That's too many for a drug company. It's too costly in manpower, human power, whatever. So we were kind of disappointed. But since that point in time, we've had some good things happen. Uh, we, Bill has been working with a molecular biologist. And they have been able to sequence the gene cluster that makes palmarolite. And in theory, you could then take that gene cluster, insert it in a bacteria, and tell the bacteria to go ahead and go to work and produce palmarolide in large amounts. A drug company would love that. So it is possible that we could eventually have a drug to fight melanoma skin cancer that comes from an Antarctic tunicate. We also have a sponge in Antarctica called Dendrilla that has been very exciting. We've had probably 10 papers come out on its chemistry. Um, and we found that there is a uh, compound in this sponge that's active against MRSA. So MRSA is that wonderful infection that you don't want to get when you go to the hospital because it's methicillin uh, resistant. It's hard to get rid of the infection. In fact, this type of MRSA that we had activity against is called a biofilm form. It's under a layer of mucus and proteins. It's the kind of thing where if you're a surgeon and you put in a, re a knee replacement, the knee, the replacement itself, can get a biofilm growing on it. And under that biofilm, you can get MRSA. And the surgeons have told me that they will have to take out the initial knee replacement, clear the, the patient of the bacterial infection, and redo the surgery a second time. Uh, you know, in the hospital over the same week, you know, so it's not like you're going home and coming back. You're actually without a knee for a while while they work on you. So this is a big deal because this is the first compound that's ever shown activity against MRSA under a biofilm. So it may give people, scientists, insights into how it works. So the point of all this is that 
Antarctica is ancient. The marine community is ancient. The chemical community is amazing. Why would we squander that biodiversity of potential chemicals that could fight human disease by allowing climate change to happen? So as I travel around the country talking about climate change, I used to get asked this question. Is the climate changing? Is it really warming? I have not been asked this question in quite a while. So I think most people agree that the planet is warming. The question now is, oh, and this is the data that proves it. <laughs> Nobody can take these data to question, right? So the question that I get now is not, is it warming? It's, okay, it's warming, but do we have anything to do with it? Isn't this just a natural cycle that the planet is going through and, and this happens uh, periodically on its own? Well, I wanna show you the data that convinced me, a scientist, and I need lots of information and compelling story to believe something, and this really did it for me. So what you're looking at is an ice core. So you're looking at an ice core that's laying on its side. What is an ice core? An ice core is a core of ice that goes down through the ice sheet of Antarctica. In this case, it's going down 3,600 meters. So it's a very deep core. And when the core comes up, it's about the diameter of, of an orange. Uh, it comes up in sections. And at the very bottom of the ice core, you're about 420,000 years ago, if you look at this graph. And that's when that ice was formed. And that's when little air bubbles were trapped in the ice at that time. That's what the atmosphere was 420,000 years ago. And so you can go through the ice core and, and look at the chemistry of those little bubbles and you can figure out carbon dioxide, that's the red line, it goes up and down. And you can indirectly calculate temperature at that time, history, that's the blue line. But I want you to look at the red line because that's the warming gas. That's carbon dioxide. That's the greenhouse gas as they call it. Look at how that red line goes up and down, and I drew a big black line across it to show you it's never been higher than 300 parts per million in 420,000 years, and they've extended it back another million now. Look what happens to that red line when we get to the Industrial Revolution. It shoots up, way up, okay? And it is growing. Uh, I think it's up to about 420 parts per million now. So that's that's a 28% increase in a well-known warming gas that's generated by the burning of fossil fuels. So for me, this is a very clear uh, signature for us having a fair amount to do with the warming that's going on right now. And you wanted to know why that red line goes up and down in those 100,000 year cycles. I know that this was right on the tip of your tongue and it's called the Milankovitch cycle. It is the elliptical orbit of the Earth around the sun in a 100,000 year period that causes this phenomenon. All right, so is Antarctica and Alabama disconnected in terms of climate change? Not necessarily, because what happens is that there is this phenomenon known as the Great Ocean Conveyor Belt. So that giant current that goes around Antarctica is very important because it moves up into both the Pacific and the Atlantic basins. And it in itself can have an impact on our climate, okay? We're talking about atmospheric pressure, humidity, air temperature, wind patterns, they're all interconnected. So what's going on in Antarctica climate-wise can influence us here. What, are we, what, what kind of things are happening here? Well, one thing is we're having a lot of what I would call extreme heat days. We're having more than we used to. I don't know if you've noticed that or not. Uh, we had an event a few years ago at the Ole Miss Alabama game. Kickoff was at 3.30. They did not have enough medics to take care of people that were in the stands getting heat stroke. Um, so we have events now that are quite dangerous to humans because of these heat, extreme heat days. Um, with the warming of the sea, we may not have more hurricanes, with climate change. But what's happening is we have hurricanes that enter the Gulf of Mexico as a category three. And then by the time they come across that super warm water and hit the coast, it's a four. And in the case of Hurricane Michael, when the forensic hurricane people came in and looked at the damage, they turned it into a five. 
So you can have sort of supercharging of, of hurricanes coming in over this warm water. Um, because the ice sheet is melting in Antarctica and in Greenland, and because as the ocean warms, the molecules of water expand, we have sea level rise. Um, and so sea level rise is now uh, showing up in places like Miami, where on sunny days you can have streets that are flooded with seawater at high tide. Uh, I don't know if you've been down to Dauphin Island on the West End, but you can get a really good deal on this house if anybody wants to get a, a beach house. Um, so Dauphin Island is a, a wonderful example of not only an ephemeral island that's moving around because it's sand, but also sea level is going to really threaten the, the homes there. And then, of course, we have more intense rainfall. We have maybe the, the same amount of rain in a year, but it's coming down harder and faster than it used to in this warmer, more uh, moist air. The Cahaba River is paying a price for this because we're seeing a lot of gouging out of the banks. Um, the community that I live in, in Cahaba Heights, we have a street now in Cahaba Heights that floods fairly regularly. And then the houses are rebuilt and sold, and then new people move in, and it happens again. It's, it's really uh, of concern. So we're seeing heavier rains, and these we don't have the infrastructure uh, to really deal with them. So, gloom and doom. But that's not what I'm going to leave you with. I want to leave you with a message of hope for a possible solution. And how cool is it that the story I'm going to tell you happened in Antarctica? And how cool was it when two technicians were sitting at their desk in 1985, and they looked at the data in front of them, and they thought, there is no way that our boss in England is going to believe these data. And they were right. He did not believe the data. In fact, he bought them a new spectrophotometer, and he sent them back to Antarctica for another year. And when they got the same story, he just said, OK, we're going to have to publish this. And they published probably one of the most important papers of the 20th century in nature. And it reported a massive hole in the ozone, that critical layer of our atmosphere that protects us from ultraviolet radiation, and also it can affect climate. Well, the amazing thing was not the paper in Nature. The amazing thing was that two years later, in 1987, 20 countries sat down around a table in Montreal, Canada, and ratified the Montreal Protocol that regulated the chlorofluorocarbons, the refrigerants, that were destroying the ozone. That is pretty amazing. Today, there's 131 signatories to the Montreal Protocol. It is by far the most successful global treaty of all time. And what's even cooler is it's worked. The companies that made the refrigerants didn't go out of business. They didn't fire their employees. They came up with a new way of making refrigerants that don't destroy the ozone. And Susan Solomon, the scientist at MIT, told me uh, she's the one that discovered the chemistry behind the destruction of the ozone. She told me that they're thinking the hole in the ozone may close mid-century now instead of end of century. So the point is that we can address global problems that have big effects and do, do so successfully. So I want to just end by telling you a little bit more about why I'm doing what I'm doing, uh, running around the country talking about climate change. I should just be holed up in my office at UAB and only open the door to yell at an occasional student, right? So what made me do this was seeing climate change happening firsthand. Uh, I felt compelled to share the story, and the National Science Foundation that supported my work for 35 years uh, is very, they like scientists to go out and talk about their research with, with the public. That's part of the, part of the deal. So the first thing I was told to do was to write a book. So I looked into writing a book for the public. So to write a book, you have to have what's called a literary agent. And then I discovered to have a literary agent, you have to have a book. So this was a challenge. I was very fortunate that I had uh, E.O. Wilson, perhaps the most famous scientist of all time, uh, who recently passed away, as you may know, an Alabaman, uh, had taken me under his wing. And he pretty much was a mentor for me uh, the last 20 or 30 years of my career. Um, and he was able to get me a literary agent uh, at, his, at his agency. And my book, Lost Antarctica, came out. And I was so excited about it, and I was getting invited to go on to radio stations, you know, NPR, talk to 5 million people. And, well, what I didn't anticipate was the phone was going to ring, 
and the director of the E.O. Wilson Foundation said, Jim, we're going to make you a board advisor, an advisory board member. And we want to make a three-minute video out of your chapter on the Adelie penguin in your book. And we're going to put it in all the zoos and aquariums. And we're so excited, and we love the pros. And I thought she was asking me if I would narrate this little video. And she said, no, we won't want you to do it. We'll have Harrison do it. And I said, Harrison who? And she said, well, Harrison Ford, of course. He's on the board with you. I said, well, that's great. So Harrison uh, has done a wonderful job with this. And you can go on YouTube uh, and listen to ghost rookeries and him uh, reading about the Adeli penguin. I also uh, had some influence on the book by this guy, uh, Bill Gates, who I was minding my business down at Palmer one day and asked to host a guest the next day. And I said, who is it? And the station uh, program manager said, uh, I can't tell you. It's secret. I said, we're in Antarctica. You got to be kidding. <laughs> and the next day, Bill Gates and his father, Bill Sr., and Bill's son, Rory, and his stepmother all arrived. And I showed them around the station. I talked about the science that was going on. They were very impressed. Bill wanted to know all about climate change. He talked about renewable energy. Um, and I took Bill and his father up to the big room where we have the giant screen that we show the National Science Foundation video about what the U.S. is doing in Antarctic science. And I sat them down in two big chairs in the front of the room. And the IT guy came in and could not boot up Microsoft. <laughs> now think about that. This went on for like three minutes. You know how long three minutes is for this poor guy in front of the Gateses? Anyway, his father looked at the son and went, you really got to fix this, Bill. And uh, I, that was my Microsoft moment. But anyway, Bill was kind enough to read the book before it came out, and he wrote a nice little thing on the front of the book cover for me. Um, the other thing I've been doing is outreach, uh, is to take people to Antarctica. Um, I thought I would do this once 16 years ago. 16 cruises later, I'm doing this every year, once a year, for Abercrombie and Kent. I've taken close to 300 Birminghamians to Antarctica aboard the cruise. Um, this is a wonderful opportunity to learn about climate change, but just experience Antarctica as well. Um, and if anybody knows anybody or would personally be interested, I do this every December. I've already got 23 people from Birmingham signed up for this trip coming up in December. Uh, you're very welcome to, to contact me and I'll give you more information about it. It's a 10 day cruise uh, out of uh, Ushuaia, Argentina. And it's neat, too, because the people on the cruise often know their, their senators, their congressmen, and, and they can make a difference in that regard. Uh, I've also been doing more speaking uh, and, and sort of working with faith groups. Um, I did a workshop with uh, Mark uh, Johnston. We had uh, three or four days at Camp McDowell. Fifty people came representing five different religions, and I spoke to the science of climate change and Mark talked about the care of creation and how it really it's a wonderful wedding of dealing with it from the environmental ecological standpoint as well as the, the faith side. And I'm happy to report I'm getting invited more and more to churches to speak about climate change. Um, for example, this one, uh, St. Stephen's, which was in the news for not such a good reason not too long ago. But they also had the wonderful blessing of the solar panels where they put a bishop in a bucket and they lifted the bucket up over the top of the roof. She was about 60 feet up, and she blessed the solar panels with water, holy water. And I just thought the bishop in the bucket, what a great op-ed. So I wrote an op-ed called The Bishop in the Bucket. Um, I'm also one of the folks that speaks for the Nature Conservancy's national program about talking about climate change and the fact that we Americans are very sheepish about talking about climate change. So the pledge doesn't ask for any money. It just says, I pledge to talk to one person about global warming or climate change, whatever you want to call it, in a week's time. And then you go to the websites, and there's all sorts of great information about how you talk to somebody about climate change. How do you talk to Uncle Joe, who does not believe in climate change? and how you want to find common ground. You want to talk about when the tomatoes are ripening, not buying a Prius, right? Um, and then I'm going to end on this note, and then I'll take qu questions. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, a couple years ago, in 2019, 
um, I was invited to the Explorers Club's annual dinner in Manhattan. And this is a big deal. They have about 2,000 people that come from all around the world. Um, and I got an award for my work in Antarctica, my research, my educational outreach. But the real honor was nothing that I got or about me. It was about the eight living Apollo astronauts that shared the stage with me that night. In fact, we were seated, my wife and I, with Mike Collins, who was the astronaut, you remember, that didn't get to the moon. He just went around the moon while the other two went down. So anyway, at the end of the evening, they asked the astronauts to each tell a little anecdote that they'd never shared with anybody. And I can remember one of them was an astronaut said something about his wedding ring slipped off his finger and it was headed outside, out the door into space and he was able to grab it at the last second and save his marriage. And I thought that was pretty good. Uh, but the real poignant moment was the, the moment that uh, Rusty Schweikert, who's got the microphone and is almost down at the very end there, he stood up and he talked to everybody and he said, uh, you know, all of us, all these astronauts have been up in space and we have all had this amazing experience. We have had the opportunity to look back at Earth and see how incredibly fragile this planet is and what the thin little biosphere that's around it that harbors our life. And it changes us, we're all changed and we all feel that we need to protect it. And that's where I wanna leave you tonight with that thought, so thank you. Oh, yes, I do have some books, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, after questions, I'll meet you up there if you'd like to buy a book, $20. It's a great deal. I'll sign it for you, and then you can sell it on eBay for $130. <laughs> I, I, seriously, I saw one listed. I don't think they ever sold it, but it, yeah. Any, okay, question. King crabs, yep. Are they cleansing the crabs themselves in order to tolerate the crabs? I mean, I know it's getting warmer for them, but... Yeah, I don't think it's so much of a change in the crabs' uh, ability to tolerate the cold. It's that the cold is becoming less cold. So the physiological curtain is being opened and they can move up. I think it's very deeply ingrained in the genome of crabs that they cannot regulate this magnesium body fluid uh, scenario and cold temperatures. So I don't think that's gonna change anytime soon. Who owns Antarctica? That's a question for you, who owns Antarctica? Everyone, isn't that cool? And how do you get away with that? You have something called the Antarctic Treaty. And the treaty was just re-ratified for another 50 years. And the treaty says that all nations can claim whatever they want, but sovereignty is not recognized. And there's no military presence and there's no mining or oil extraction. Antarctica is a continent for science and collaboration and peace. It's really quite remarkable if you think about this massive continent that is in that position. Um, now there are, I will just mention very quickly, there are two countries that take sovereignty very seriously and they are Argentina and Chile and they do claim the peninsula, both of them. It's in their maps. When Argentina visits our station, they do not ask permission to bring their ship to us. They come, they bring good wine. <laughs> Argentina had a program to send young couples to Antarctica to give birth. I visited an Argentina station where there were 20 third graders and all their parents living there for a year. How do you claim land? You give birth upon it. How do you claim land? You have a community. How do you prove you have a community? You have a school. So all these things are being done as a, a statement of sovereignty. Uh, but they're good. I mean, they don't, they're not, they're not breaking any rules. They're just making it clear that this is theirs. Yeah. yeah, you have to have a scientific presence if you want to be part of the Antarctic Treaty nations. 
Now, I will say that there's probably a dozen nations that are doing significant science, and I mean really top-notch science, and we're one of them. Then there's a whole host of countries that have a double wide and they come out every day and take the air temperature with a thermometer. That is their science program. But it gets them into a certain level of, they're there, they have a presence, they're doing minimal science, but they're doing something. Um, so most countries want to be part of that organization. There's also a ruling party, of, there's, a, there's a sort of a law component of the treaty that regulates the fisheries because the fisheries do need to be regulated in Antarctica. They're very uh, susceptible to overfishing. And so they have some pretty strict regulations. And then the cruise industry, they do keep an eye on tourists going to Antarctica. Uh, and the, the tour ships, I never thought I would, I would do this as a scientist to go to Antarctica on a tour ship. Um, but I, I really love it. I've been con converted. Uh, they really do a good job of educating people about the environmental fragility of Antarctica and how to, how to visit it and not make any, uh, any damage to it. And they educate them to the point where they become ambassadors to Antarctica. And I think it outweighs any sort of a negative in my mind. So I think it's a good thing. But hopefully it won't get so popular that they have to regulate the numbers. But that hasn't happened yet. Yes. Polar bears. So it's funny that you say that because polar bears are in the Arctic, in the Northern Hemisphere. And if they were in the Southern Hemisphere, we'd have far fewer penguins. Um, the polar bears are an interesting situation. I just got back from leading a cruise to the Arctic and I talked about Arctic climate change. We saw seven polar bears with the most fantastic sightings we had a mother and her cub literally approached the ship. So they were like 40 feet from all of us. Uh, and we were up on the ship, so we were safe from the polar bears. But when we go to shore in the Arctic, they have to put people with rifles. Uh, they set up a perimeter before we were allowed to go in. The seven polar bears that we saw on this latest trip that I did looked really healthy. They, they were not emaciated. Uh, they looked well-fed. So that was good because on previous trips, um, there have been reports that some of them are having a hard time finding food. Because what's happening with polar bears is that they feed on, essentially, their natural prey are seals. And they go out on the sea ice and they sit very patiently at a hole waiting for a seal to come up. And then, boom, they've got a 300-pound dinner. And what happens with the depletion of the sea ice is they're moving to land to hunt. And one year, the, the cruise company that I work with, I wasn't on this cruise, but they came across polar bears that were foraging on ox. Uh, they were in a bird rookery eating the eggs and the chicks. And that's probably not typical. It may, it, it's probably not impossible before climate change, but uh, I think in general it's accepted that the polar bears are having a tough time because of the loss of the sea ice. I think there's about, I forget, maybe is it 20,000? I don't know, the number of polar bears is down globally. Uh, and they're also uh, moving into areas they've never been before. And there's some interbreeding with brown bears, grizzly bears and things. No, no polar bears in Antarctica. They never, they never got there. I mean, that's a great question, but they never, when, when the continents split apart, polar bears were not in the picture on the piece that went south. Yeah. The apex predators would be leopard seals and killer whales. And we see killer whales. We saw killer whales, um, they hunt in packs like wolves. We saw them uh, chasing penguins one day. And there had to be about maybe eight or nine killer whales. And they were circling them and darting in and grabbing them. You know, it was very much an organized hunt. Uh, but they're very impressive animals, killer whales. Are there any uh, land mammals? No, there are no land mammals in Antarctica, only marine mammals. Yeah, uh, there is one insect, and I tried to get E.O. Wilson to come with me, but he told me he wouldn't come to Antarctica with me unless I found an ant. And I said, there is an ant. It's in the title, Antarctica. And it didn't, it didn't work. Uh-uh, I don't think he wanted to go across the Drake Passage. Anyway, there is one insect. It's a midge. goes through its whole life cycle in two weeks. <clears throat> So there aren't very many. You don't have to worry about mosquitoes. Any other questions? Yeah. Correct. 
Great question. Why is the west portion of Antarctica more affected by warming than the east? There's two theories. One is um, the Antarctic circumpolar current, which is warming, goes around Antarctica clockwise direction, and it shallows along the western side of the continent. That means it's bringing heat with it up shallower, and that one thought is that that could be an influence. The other is, is the hole in the ozone. And the idea that the hole in the ozone is having more of an effect on the wind patterns on the eastern side of the continent than the west, and that these wind patterns could somehow be related to the lack of warming, which, if you think about it, is kind of scary because it might mean that by fixing the hole in the ozone, it's going to accelerate warming over on the east. But, but we now know the east is warming as well because of that current underneath the melt under the glaciers uh, over on the west side is happening too. But it's the west and the peninsula that are warming the fastest. Uh, if you looked at all of Antarctica, the net picture is warming, okay? The east doesn't offset the west. People used to think it might, but it doesn't. How long did it take me to write the book? Uh, my wife says forever. Um, I wrote it in about nine months. So with a book like Lost Antarctica, you actually get a contract up front. I had a contract that gave me one year to produce the book. And I discovered I could write a chapter a month and still be a professor at UAB and remain married. Um, so I, I wrote every morning for about two, I, I tried to get like 500 words down, two type pages, a couple hours every morning, didn't matter if it was a weekend, but it was the consistency of working every day for a little bit. And I've talked to other people that write that say the big mistake is to just keep putting it off. It's, oh, I'll do it, I'll do it all during the weekend. And then it gets to be too much. So that worked pretty well. And then there was another month or so where the book went back and forth with the publisher and me and all that sort of copy edit. Oh, copy editors, they are wicked. Do not like copy editors. Copy editor put a big line through about 10 pages of my book. I was so heartbroken. And then uh, my poet friend at UAB, Adam Bynes, he's a very good writer. He looked at it and said, I think the copy editor was right. <laughs> he said, but you'll put it in another book. And so when I wrote my book about fishing, it actually had some pertinence to fishing, what I had talked about, and it ended up up in that book. So that was good. I felt better about that. But it's an interesting process. I'm going to start my third book soon, in the, in the winter and spring. I'm going to hole up on Dauphin Island in a little rental house and do a sabbatical. Yeah. Temperature extremes in the Antarctic compared to the Arctic. Uh, I think they're more... They're colder, they're more extreme at the South Pole in Antarctica than they would be at the North Pole. I'm pretty sure of that. Um, I think the record temperature is like Vostok, which is a sort of near our South Pole station, um, was like negative, what, minus 105 or something like that. Um, it does get to 100 below zero at the South Pole station, the US station. I know this because I have met members of the 300 Club. Now. If you want to join the 300 Club, it's not easy. First of all, you have to be one of a dozen people selected to spend eight months of the winter at the pole. Then you have to wait halfway through for it to get to a minus 100 degrees one day. Then you have to go into the sauna and crank it up to like 200 or something, or 100. Is it 100? 200? You got to go 300 degree differential. Yeah. You're allowed to wear your boots. You run outside from the sauna around what used to be the dome. It's no longer a dome. They must run around something else. Have your picture taken and then back inside. And then you are an official member of the 300 Club. So there are people on the planet that have joined. Some extremities have been frostbitten. Yeah. So it doesn't get that cold in the Arctic, um, I don't believe. Um, Coldest I ever experienced in my life was minus 60 at McMurdo Station one day. And that was, that was so cold that if you didn't have something covering your skin on your face, it, it prickled, you know? It just sort of felt like it was burning your skin. 
I can't imagine minus 100. Other questions? Yeah, in the back. You're talking about bubble feeding in the whales? Oh, I don't know if there's a lot of nitrogen in whale bubbles. That's a good question. I don't think so. Uh huh. Are you talking about getting the bends like when you're scuba diving and you have you can have nitrogen bubbles? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the whales are not those are not bubbles inside the whale. They're they're blowing bubbles. Uh-huh. Okay, I'll take their word for it. I, I don't. Uh -uh. Sorry. Did you have a question too? Okay. All right. Well, thank you very. Oh, one final question, Janet. Thank you. I'll give you your check later. <laughs> Appreciate it. Oh, really, that means a lot. Thank you.